Welcome back to day two of e-learning, everybody. Um, I am just so impressed and thankful for my students. Day one lessons are rolling in, and we're almost to the end of our, you know, our first series of lessons. And I've got almost 100% participation. I've got about 87% of everybody's assignments in so far. And I promise you, day one was the top of the hill, and it's kind of downhill from here. We've got a little bit less lecturing to do from here on out because we're all caught up. So I just want to say I'm so thankful for you. I'm so proud of you. Um, I really miss you, but I hope you're doing real well out there. Let me know if you need anything, okay? Just reach out to me if you need anything at all, even if it's just a little bit of an emotional boost. Email me or DM me, and I'll... um. I'll be sure to um, provide you whatever care I can, okay? All right, um, well, now saying that, I'm tr trying to be uplifting, but we're actually going to talk about the Great Depression today, <laughs> so it's going to kind of shift gears a little bit. The last time we left off in our lecture, we had started talking about um, what was going on with the 1920s and the growth of this really big economy of people wanting material goods. Um, whether it be a uh, refrigerator or a radio or a toaster oven or whatever. People have all of these material goods now, and they're using things like consumer credit to buy it. And so we're going to talk about how that led to an economic depression. Might even talk about the kind of economic depression we're facing right now. Uh, not a depression, but financial um, financial downturn that we're having right now. Um, and maybe make a few connections. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, so the big questions we want to focus on for this lecture, and I want you to make a really strong mental note of, how successful were these programs during the New Deal in solving the problems of the Great Depression? You know, were these programs um, that FDR instituted, were they relieving the economy, helping the economy to recover, and were they reforming to ensure that we didn't have those issues again? I will let you all decide that. Um, secondly, how did the New Deal change the role of the federal government? We're going to see the federal government almost completely flip upside down because of FDR and these programs, um, but I want you to be able to tell me how. How did the federal government change? Okay, let's start off with um, the size of um, the Great Depression and what the Great Depression actually is. All right, so the Great Depression um, really begins with this economic downturn that started because of the stock market crashing. Um, there were a couple other factors that led to this market crash, um, which we can talk about um, a little bit here is is just basically people wanting to buy those goods on credit, those radios, those refrigerators, um, those very, very early cars. And buying those things on credit um, meant that you didn't have the money in your pocket to pay for those goods, but eventually you were going to pay for them. Well, long story short, people start defaulting on some of these loans, these credits that they're taking out to buy these products. And the whole thing just leads to a really big market crash. Um, this all starts on Black Tuesday. They call it Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. Um, the Great Depression officially ends once the United States enters World War II in 1941. So let's take a look at a couple of these causes. The stock market speculation. So thinking that the stock market was moving a certain way when it actually wasn't, thinking the stock market was stronger than it actually was. Another big thing is that unequal distribution of wealth. We've talked in class a lot about the working class folk, um, immigrants or, or skilled laborers that are working in factories and cities, and don't forget about those farmers. Don't forget about rural workers as well. So we've got people on this lower class, and then we've got people in this really high upper class, and there's not a strong middle class. Now just think, what do we use the middle class for? What's the, what's the purpose, what's the need for a really strong middle class? I mean, the middle class buys things. The middle class is the most, the class that um, 
it, it's supposed to be the largest. You know, most people are supposed to fall into that middle class bracket and they buy things. And buying things helps the economy to keep going. The excessive use of credit or too much debt. So like I said, people using too much credit to buy things that they can't really afford. Um, industrial and agricultural overproduction. So people are making too many things. They're, make, they're producing too many goods and those goods aren't being bought. And so that means, you know, if there's overproduction, then that means companies are going to cut down on um, the number of employees that they hire. There are government policies like the Holly Smoot tariff. Don't we talked about that in our last chapter? And those tariffs mean that trading with other countries is going to be a little more difficult. And tariffs are really hard on which industry? Do you remember? Do you remember? Farmers. Farmers don't really care for tariffs. They really wreck the industry. Um, bank failures eventually come about because of. Um, this excessive use of credit, um, as well as just the, mar the stock market crashing in itself. Um, and the effects of all of these things, and I'm going to go back a slide just to, just to tell you, all six of these causes happening at the same time creates for this really big economic destruction. And the effects of that lead to a 25% unemployment rate. And you can kind of see that in the photo below. A lot of people are having to stand in bread lines to pick up food to feed their families. Um, and a high unemployment rate is going to mean that people aren't buying things. And the more people aren't buying things, you're right, the worse the economy is getting. Um, the decline in the gross, gross national product, so the amount of stuff, that we are making as a nation is declining. And if people aren't making stuff, then that means people aren't making money because they're not working. And if you're not making stuff, people aren't going to buy it either. Um, and so the gross national product actually is cut almost in half by 50%. That's going to cause a really big issue. Um, the other big thing that's going to happen is there's an end to Republican political dominance since the Civil War, because Republicans are in charge of a lot of these um, economic policies, people aren't going to be too happy or too pleased with the way the Republican government is running, gov is running things during this economic turmoil. Um, hobos and bread lines, foreclosures, evictions. I mean, we've got people in some really, really bad situations. Um, and that's going to cause a huge societal issue. A huge economic issue and it's going to cause some shifts to happen politically okay let's take a break um challenge question number one an underlying cause of the great depression that began in 1929 was what so which of these is going to be one of the major causes of the great depression give you a minute to look through those options and answer Okay, and don't forget that this question is going to pop up in your quiz, um, your non-mastery practice quiz at the end of our, um, as soon as you get done taking our lecture notes today. All right, so the president during all of this action is Herbert Hoover. Now, Herbert Hoover is the one that instituted this Holly Smoot tariff of 1930. Um, and that significantly reduced foreign trade because it was retaliatory towards Europeans. Um, and so Europe kind of cuts off a bunch of trade with the United States. And in the long term, it just leads to a lot of economic issues. Um, now, Herbert Hoover, in the midst of all of this economic depression, thought that relief should come from private charity. You know, we see people standing in line because they're unemployed and they're looking for food, um, high levels of tariffs, banks are closing, um, the stock market is crashing. And he really believes that if private companies and state and local governments do something, we could fix the economy. He does not believe that the federal government needs to do something about these specific issues. And because of that, Herbert Hoover is blamed for worsening the depression, making things worse. And so people start actually naming things after him. Um, they, like Hooverville's are these, uh, these basic 
slums that people are having to live in because they've lost their houses and they've foreclosed on their housing and so they're living on the streets. Hoover blankets are these like makeshift blankets that people might make out of newspapers as you can see down here in this uh, photograph below. Uh, Hoover wagons. Now this one you're really going to love. Um, cars that are having to be towed by um, horseback because we can't afford to buy the gasoline to actually go inside of the car. Um, Hoover flags, which are these makeshift flags. Um, so people are not big fans of Herbert Hoover and his public um, acceptance begins to dwindle quite a bit. Now all of this kind of leads to the big bonus army march of 1932. These bonus marchers are World War I veterans and they had been promised a bonus um, after the completion of World War I should they lead to retirement. And because most of them are unemployed, they're starving, um, they march on Washington, D.C., and they demand that they get their bonus early. Look, we need to feed our families. We fought in the war, we risked our lives, and we deserve to get paid in order to avoid homelessness. So they set up camps outside of the the White House and Congress um, and demand to be paid. Now, I think this is a really um, important time for Herbert Hoover to act. Everybody's kind of looking at him. How is he going to react to these bonus marchers? Well, it doesn't really go too well. This is a photograph of those bonus marchers kind of camped out inside of, outside of Washington, D.C. You can see that they're bringing their families along with them. And see how they're using his name to kind of talk about their concerns with how he's reacting. So what happens is Hoover, Herbert Hoover refuses to even meet with these bonus marchers after they finally reach D.C. He doesn't even leave the White House to talk to them. Instead, he sends out the police in the U.S. Army um, who use, as you can see below, violent tactics, batons, um, burning down camps in order to get these U.S. Army vets, and these are veterans, American Army veterans, kicking them out of Washington, D.C. and burning down the camps that they've been living in along the way. And this is just the end of Herbert Hoover's political career. People are not going to accept this kind of reaction to homeless veterans that are demanding their paychecks, demanding their retirement so that they can feed their families. All right, so the objective of this bonus expeditionary force, these bonus marchers that led the march on Washington, D.C. in 1932, was to obtain what? What were they looking for? Go ahead and pause the video. Make sure you know the answer to this question before you move on. Okay. Um, so, in 1932, a uh, very short time after these bonus marchers march on Washington, the election is held between Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Herbert Hoover, and I'm not shocked by these results <laughs> at all, uh, but you can see that the nation is definitely uh, feeling a certain way about Herbert Hoover, and FDR becomes the next president of the United States. Now, this is a reading review. You might have to whip out your AMSCO in order to um, answer this question. What was an important result of the 1936 presidential campaign? Okay, what was it? What was the result of that? Was it A, the shift of African American voters from the Republican Party to the Democrats? B, a move of intellectuals to Alf Landon and the Republican ticket. C, a landslide win by Republicans in Congress. Uh, D, the emergence of a viable third party. Or E, the decline in support for the New Deal. Either Google it, get out your amps, go and search, pause this video and find the answer to that question. All right, so who was FDR? Who was Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Well, um, he was an interesting man. He had a really interesting history. He was actually paralyzed with polio at the age of 39. Very, very young age. It was uh, paralyzed from the waist down, and it completely transformed him. I think after an experience like that, 
the age of 39, being completely paralyzed, I think you really start to think about the world differently. And you start to think about um, what it's like to have a disability, what it's like to be disadvantaged in some way. And you might see the world through a different lens. Now, upon being elected, now in the, in the midst of an economic depression, he promises the nation. He says, I'm going to provide you a new deal. I'm going to give you a new deal in these really troubling times. I'm going to increase government spending in order to fix the economy. This is not the state and local government's problem. This is the federal government's problem. We've got to take charge and do something about it. Uh, fun fact about him, he's the only president to ever serve more than two terms in office. He served four terms as president from 1933 to 1945, all consecutive. We'll talk about how he was able to do that later. He pioneered for liberalism and an increased government action. So modern day liberalism really is about the government, the federal government, being more interactive with the American people and the American way of life and fixing government problems or national problems like an, a market crash. Um, he promoted more diversity than other previous presidents. Don't get excited. It's nothing super exciting. But he did appoint more women to office, um, African Americans, Catholics, people of the Jewish faith. Um, Francis Perkins is the Secretary of Labor during his presidency, which is pretty exciting. Um, the country was set at ease with these fireside chats. You might notice that in our haiku link, we also have some fireside chats. You might have been wondering what those even meant. Well, what this was, everybody has a radio in their house. Radio is the new technology, the new way to communicate. FDR, once a week, every single week, once a week, would sit down and create an entire newscast to the, to the whole nation, giving them information on where we were, what was going on in the country at the time, what his plans were for solving some of these new problems, just giving them an update. And people really found this to be a couple things, I think. Number one, it really made FDR more personable. He was a real person you could talk to. And there was, the second thing, a level of comfort that came with FDR. A level of comfort in knowing what was going to happen, how the president was going to fix it, that he realized and recognized that there were problems. People felt at ease with FDR in these fireside chats. And I think it's one of the most notable things about his presidency and what makes him such a special president for us. Um, he's quoted as saying in his first inaugural address, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, really boosting this new energy, this new um, uh, confidence inside of the American people. We can overcome this. We can survive. All we need to do is push forward in pursuit of a better America. And people really bought into this and believed it. Um, probably, for me personally, uh, more inspiring than FDR was his beautiful wife, Eleanor. Um, Eleanor was considered to be one of the most active first ladies in American history. Um, during this entire time, FDR's whole presidency, presidency she traveled throughout the country, and she saw it as her job to continue to reassure and encourage American people that um, there was a better life, there was a better way ahead. And we'll talk about this more um, once we get closer to World War II and we lecture over World War II. But she actually is instrumental in uh, writing our nation's universal declaration of human rights. We have Eleanor Roosevelt to thank for that. All right, so the New Deal, what is it? Now, the New Deal is FDR's program for fixing the Great Depression. And within this program, he had the three R's. Relief, we need to find relief for people that need it, whether that be food or money or shelter, whatever. Number two, recovery. We need to be like creating programs that help to fix this economy because if the economy gets fixed, People can work again. People can afford food again. People can afford housing again. And we can begin to kind of rebuild and grow from 
the issues that we've, we've been having and facing. The last thing is reform that we needed to, FDR says, create a new system of government that ensures this never happens again. We don't want to ever have to go through a Great Depression again. And this is the first time in American history that the federal government becomes active in this way. You know, the federal government's never been in charge of the economy, fixing the economy, um, providing welfare to people that are either homeless or unemployed um, or starved. Um, this was a new, a new way of life, a new way of thinking. And FDR is credited with this new federal system that we have in the country today. Uh, his first 100 days in office were a very busy first 100 days. Let's take a look at him, okay? The first thing that he does is creates the FDIC. You've probably, like, watched a uh, Chase Bank commercial and you've heard the FDIC before. Now, the FDIC is in charge of protecting civilian bank deposits. So, every time you put money inside of the bank, the bank ensures that that money will be there when you go to get it out of the bank. You know, they're not going to use your money to invest in the market and then you not have the opportunity to go back to your bank and get your money out should the market crash. The second big thing, the Public Works Administration. Um, this gave money to state and local governments in order to build infrastructure. We needed to spend money to build roads, bridges, dams, we have to get thousands of construction jobs going so we can get the nation literally moving again. But this also created jobs, kind of two birds, one stone sort of thing. The Civilian Conservation Corps um, was kind of along the same lines of the PWA, but it was more based in the environment. Um, so putting a lot of young men to work building trees, um, protecting the environment, making sure that a dust bowl wasn't going to happen again. We're going to get farmers to work out on the West Coast. The Tennessee Valley Authority is going to build dams and hydroelectric power plants to promote economic development. This created extreme, I love this, this is genius. FDR creates really cheap electricity for the American people that live alongside a lot of these lakes and rivers. If we can create dams that create electricity, we can get people having electricity for little to no cost and paying people to build these dams along the way. Genius. Um, the Federal Housing Administration that we still um, utilize today provided bank loans for people to not just build new houses, but also repair old ones and help first time home buyers purchase some of these houses. Today, um, we have a housing and urban development program that was actually created by um, Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 60s, so we'll talk about that once we get to a, a few lectures from now. Um, but this is, again, the first time that the federal government is ensuring that everyone has a home, that we can provide housing for everyone that needs it. The Agricultural Adjustment Administration is just FDR saying, listen, farmers, I have not forgotten about you. I know that farmers need to be paid more in order to decrease production, raise the prices on the goods of the production that they do make, um, and allow them to uh, be paid more, essentially, for the kind of the things that they're creating. Sorry about that. The dog started going crazy and I had to cut it off. Anyway, Agricultural Adjustment Administration was supposed to aid farmers and protect farmers. Um, but eventually it's declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court because the federal government isn't allowed or what the Supreme Court says shouldn't be allowed to um, adjust the price of, of products. Okay. Um, the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, no, not that NRA, another NRA, um, was meant to persuade businesses to decrease the level of production, limit the amount of hours per week that an employee was allowed to work, um, and standardize minimum wages in order to boost the economy. Uh, long story short, the Constitution also declared this unconstitutional, um, not allowing the government to kind of adjust the economy in that kind of way. So, 
you know, FDR wasn't able to get some of these things done, but um, really tried to get some of those things done. Ooh, la, la. Um, <laughs> we call all of these organizations that FDR created in order to bring the nation out of these Great Depressions his alphabet soup. It's kind of like he just opened up a can of alphabet soup uh, and picked up three letters at a time and then just made an organization out of it. Okay, so what was the purpose of the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act? Um, go ahead and pause your video. Go through these options. Make sure you feel really good about a specific answer. It will pop up in your post-lecture practice quiz. All right. So the second New Deal uh, was the second round of relief and reform that comes from FDR during his presidency, um, indirectly focusing on fixing the economy by encouraging citizens to buy stuff. The more you buy, the stronger the economy will be. So the Works Progress Administration um, was a federal relief agency that spent a billion dollars in order to pay for infrastructural improvements. Um, this also included public art, which is why we talk about a lot of artists or unskilled workers being um, employed by the WPA, and you can kind of see that um, down here. And while some of these artists are also being employed in order to promote the work that's being done by FDR and his alphabet suit programs. Um, we're also building new roads, we're building bridges, we're trying to get people out into the public to spend money and be a part of the, the community. So these are some of the um, pieces of artwork that are created by the WPA. And they all have the same um, style to them, especially like these blockier looking styles, showing the nation back at work again, you know, drink your milk, it's good for your teeth, vitality, endurance, and, bo and bones, <laughs> as noted by these very strong children. <laughs> Don't forget to wear your goggles in order to do an, avoid infection. Have a first aid kit on hand. So for my uh, Star Wars fans out there. Now, um, probably one of the most notable parts of FDR's presidency was the Social Security Act. This was the first social welfare program um, targeting mostly the elderly um, and those that were unable to support themselves, too. So if you were um, a disabled American and you had a disability that, that kept you from working, you could pull Social Security which was an income that supported you because you were unable to work. Um, but it's the same for the elderly, too. If the elderly can't work, they need a way to um, pay for a living. We still have the Social Security program today. There are lots of people that have identified issues with Social Security, um, but it definitely has saved the, the lives of a lot of elderly people, especially after they're um, finding themselves in retirement. Um, current workers in the system would pay taxes on Social Security so that the elderly wouldn't have to work. All right, so which of the following is true about the 1935 Social Security Act? Go ahead and pause your video. George wants you to pause your video. It's my dog. And pick the right answer for our practice quiz. Get right, buddy. Um, the 1937 court packing bill um, was FDR trying to add some extra Supreme Court justices to the courts in order to protect these legislations. Don't forget that twice during his first term, his first 100 days, um, there were members of the Supreme Court that just said, listen, this is too much power for a president to have. The president's not meant to do all of this, and we're going to put a stop to it. 
and this kind of court packing, putting extra justices on the court that would support his programs, was one way that FDR was hoping to get some leverage in that. Um, the result of it is that FDR was accused of trying to be a dictator. He was trying to go around democracy in order to get what he wanted, which is true. <laughs> um, the court packing bill was eventually defeated by Republicans and Democrats. You know, even people that supported FDR said, look, this is going too far. You can't simply do what you want um, just because you want it. You've really got to work within the system. The Supreme Court did begin to support some of these New Deal programs um, once he gets into his second term and they notice how helpful some of these programs can be. Um, and they did that without FDR stepping in and utilizing a court packing bill. Now, the opposition to the New Deal was mainly from conservatives that wanted the government um, to slow down on its spending. So, oh gosh, this is kind of confusing, but deficit spending is the idea that you've got, let's say the nation has five dollars in its banking account the federal government has five dollars to spend and fdr says well you know we really need to spend ten dollars it, it in order to get the economy working again we got to spend ten dollars and if we spend ten dollars yes we might have a deficit we might have a five dollar difference we might be in the negative five dollars but that means that um, the money we put into the economy eventually will make up for the lack that we've had. Um, spending more than what you actually have can mean that the economy can get up and running again. It's kind of a weird concept, but um, conservatives weren't really big on it. They thought that deficit spending was socialism, that it was... Um, it, it was bad. It could be bad for the economy. It could backfire and create really big issues, larger issues. Liberals thought that the New Deal was too conservative. They said FDR wasn't going far enough to actually boost the economy. Huey Long, um, which we talked about in our last lecture, that big socialist advocate, um, he was one of those that said FDR really needs to do more in order to help boost the economy. Um, we need to share more wealth with society. We need to um, pursue more spending so that we don't have a lower class. The American Communist Party definitely was opposed to FDR's programs, um, deciding that it wasn't enough, that what we needed as a nation was to ditch this idea of capitalism and buy into this idea of communism to get the economy rolling again. Nonetheless, um, FDR's programs really did strengthen the labor movement and working class people. Um, the strength of these labor unions meant that people were guaranteed workers' rights under a labor union. And a lot of this is done through that collective bargaining um, that we talked about in class a few weeks ago. Um, we were going to institute and enforce laws that protected workers' rights, that they had a, a shorter work day, that there was um, some sort of a, a, a minimum wage that workers would be paid. We're going to cut down on the amount of child labor that we see. There were several violent strikes and protests despite this new um, Wagner Act that was passed. Um, and so FDR has to kind of maneuver his way around that. Congress of Industrial Organizations um, is kind of an organization that develops outside of the American Federation of Labor. We've talked about this labor union before. It attempted to unite all kinds of industrial workers, um, so not just workers that were skilled or white um, or male. Um, it didn't actually succeed in that. But the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 was passed, and like I said, this is really when FDR gets a win. He sets a minimum wage, a maximum amount of work hours to 40 per week, and restricts child labor past the age of 16. All right, challenge question number six. The Congress of Industrial Organizations was most interested in unionizing which of the following? Um, remember, the AFL is where this Congress of Industrial Workers comes from. 
Was it A, migrant farm workers, B, white collar factory managers, C, unskilled and semi-skilled factory workers, D, sailors, or E, women? What's the answer? Um, about this time, there was this big dust bowl taking place mostly out there in the western plain region of the country. Um, severe drought and high winds kind of mixed together created this um, environmental phenomenon of our time, making farming almost impossible out here on the Great Plains. And if you know anything about the Great Plains, um, you know that the Great Plains were a, a large spot for, for farming to take place. A lot of the people leaving the East Coast were going out west to farm. Um, many of these people down here in Oklahoma, call them Okies, um, they actually picked up, picked up their lives in Oklahoma, moved to California in order to avoid this dust bowl. And I mean, we are not just seeing like, it's dusty outside, like it is dusty, y'all. Um, really big winds that are taking hold of these neighborhoods and, um, communities so much so that, I mean, you couldn't really breathe the air. Oh, the dogs are really disturbed by the dust bowl. Abigail, it's okay. It's just dust. All good. Everybody's safe now. Everyone survived. Well, I take that back. Not everybody. Um, John Steinbeck was the author that wrote about these Okies, these people that had to kind of pick up their lives there on the Great Plains in order to survive. The Grapes of Wrath is a really great book, but if you're really looking for the Steinbach gold, you're going to want to go to Of Mice and Men. This is one of my all-time favorite stories. I just love this story. If you haven't read it, you definitely have to. Woody Guthrie is one of Ms. Haddock's favorite singer-songwriters. Um, yes, he's a crazy white guy, but he sang a lot about overcoming the Great Depression. So he spoke to, as a singer-songwriter, he really spoke to lower-class people, poor people that had to deal with the brunt of this economic downturn. You know, it wasn't the rich people that had to deal with the Depression. It wasn't really the middle-class people. But the poor people were the ones who really suffered. And Woody Guthrie really wanted to speak their truth. Also, had this awesome sticker on the front of his guitar. Yeah. Uh, Dorothea Lang, the photographer who captured this beautiful photograph depicting what life was like during the Great Depression. Um, this is the, the photograph that you all know of. This is Dorothea, Dorothea Lang right here. Um, this mother here um, holding her children, of course, like homeless mother, kind of living um, almost in, in the middle of nowhere, trying, trying to feed her children. So some of her photographs here. that photo again. I just think that this photo kind of speaks volumes of what what people actually had to had to face in the midst of this um, in the midst of this great depression. Um, you can almost see the the worry, the fear on her face, um, what she what she's enduring. Her children leaning on her, relying on her in order to survive. Um, that's really what what this is about. Also, this woman uh, might look extremely old. She might look towards the age of a grandmother, but a very, very young mother who's just been stressed to the max trying to help her family survive. Um, another big thing to come out of this era, the Great Depression, are the, the use of comic books. Um, and I think, you know, there's an element to the comic book industry, oops, sorry, um, kind of speaking about uh, or, or trying to use stories in order to influence people and, and guide people to um, towards hope. 
and knowing that there's someone out there that's going to protect us from this, um, protect us from this destruction that we find ourselves in, this panic that we find ourselves in. Don't forget about political cartoons. We always want to take some time to analyze political cartoons. So you can see FDR, this figure right here in the center, which is very close to what he looked like in real life, but he's also wearing the FDR hat, so you kind of know that that's him because of that. Who's this guy here? He's got on some secretive pajamas down here in the, in the base, in the bottom. Um, Congress resembled here. So see all these like little bottles, these medicine bottles kind of sitting over here next to Uncle Sam. And Uncle Sam looks ill. He looks, he looks, he looks troubled. And FDR is saying to Congress, um, you know, to, to the, the maid or the wife or the nurse or whatever, of course, we may have to change remedies if we don't get the results that we want. You know, we might have to try new things uh, in, in order to fix this sickness, in order to get us out of this mess. Um, we're going to have to try a lot of different pills. We're going to have to try a lot of remedies. Um, and you're just going to have to kind of trust this process. Now, during um, all of these alphabet soup programs, um, we can kind of see the change of the unemployment rate over time. I think that this is most telling of how effective FDR's programs were. Um, John Maynard Keynes um, um, is a famous ec economist, sorry, um, and he made the argument for deficit spending. Remember, I told you a lot of people had an issue with that. Why would you spend more money than you have to fix problems of spending money? <laughs> well, Keynesian and um, uh, FDR are going to say that if you put more money into the economy, if you put more money out there in order to in increase um, stability for people, then the economy will eventually grow from that. Um, and it proved right. It, I mean, I don't, I don't really, I'm not an economist, but if we're looking at the unemployment rate here, um, being at its peak around 1932, 1933, and then once we get to World War II, the unemployment rate is well, well below 5%, um, the lowest it had been in quite a long time. And the legacy of the New Deal um, is quite fascinating. It didn't actually help to end the Great Depression, but it definitely helped. You know, these programs didn't fix the economy overnight. But eventually we were able to not only survive the Great Depression, but grow out of the Great Depression. And the biggest thing that happens is the role of the federal government completely changes. Because of FDR and all of his big economic programs, the federal government starts to take responsibility for the individual citizen, for the livelihood of one person. The government sees itself as the job, its job is to protect individual people, their employment, their livelihood, their housing, their job. That's the first time that's ever been thought of before. And in 1938, there was a shift of focus from the economy to the threat of Germany. But the New Deal, um, after it completed the move um, to Democrats as progressive reformers, you know, Democrats become progressive after the Great Depression, um, Brian suggested that Teddy Rose, Teddy, I'm sorry, Brian suggested um, all of these progressive reform programs um, like Teddy Roosevelt did and Wilson kind of, kind of started. And so because of all of those, oh, I'm sorry, progressive reforms, progressive programs, um, we're able to kind of move forward with a new look at Germany and how Germany is influencing the rest of the world. All right, challenge question number seven. Policy initiatives during FDR's first two presidential terms, so this is prior to World War II, included all of the following except for what? So which of these things, which of these policies did FDR not include? A, restricting agricultural production. B, restoring public confidence in banking. C, deficit financing or deficit spending. D, nationalizing basic industries. Or E, creating new jobs in the public sector. Which of these did not happen? Go back through your notes and try to figure it out. And this takes us to 
some of our last questions that you'll need to prepare for your practice quiz after your lecture. Have you had a good time? I've had such a good time talking about FDR. I think he's fascinating. Okay, so I want you to be able to analyze the responses of FDR's administration to the problems of the Great Depression, how effective those responses were, and how it changed the role of the federal government. Hmm, that sounds a lot like an SAQ. And if you think it sounds like a short answer question, then you're right, it is. Don't forget, when you're answering questions like this, SAQs, there's a three-step process. Number one, answer the damn question. Number two, Use specific historical evidence to support your answer. And then last but not least, your third to fourth sentence of an SAQ response. Explain the connection between the evidence and the answer that you provided. Okay? Um, so we're actually, like I said, in that question, analyzing FDR's administration and how it responded to the problems of the Great Depression how effective they were, and how it changed the role of the government. Um, okay, that's about it. We're going to write those answers here in just a minute. Um, what I wanted to point out to you all before we left is that while we are on this really crazy, um, this really crazy, oh no, Abby's in my shoes. Abigail, get out of my shoes. Come here. Abigail, Abigail Fillmore, come here. Sorry, y'all, she was literally eating my, my favorite shoe. Get up here. Quit eating shoes. Um, I wanted to say that while you guys are out for the next few weeks, um, there is a live streaming of um, Ken Burns videos on Netflix. Uh, Ken Burns is a really uh, cool historian. He's got some actually really cool documentaries. So if you're interested at all in any of these documentaries, you can get online and watch them. Um, my personal favorite is the one about prohibition. And I really, really, really love the national parks. So you can definitely watch that if you get a minute to do it. Okay. All right. That's it. That's all I've got for you. I hope you're doing well. I kept it under 50 minutes. Good for me. Good for you. Get to your practice quiz. Good luck. Email me if you have questions. I miss you guys so much. I hope you're doing okay. All right. Take good care of each other.